the, of the optimal transport problem consists in minimizing the following quantity. Here C is our cost, uh, and we want to minimize among all possible maps, uh, sending the first mass to the second one. They are called the transport maps. That formulation is not really, uh, at the mathematical level, it's quite hard to handle. And uh, Kantorovich introduced the second formulation, which is much more uh, mathematical appealing, which is the following. We want to minimize the cost, but uh, this time we are uh, moving masses by mean of uh, uh, transport plants that are probability measures in the space, in the product space, uh, with the property that uh, the first marginal is uh, the first measure mu naught, and the second marginal coincides with the second uh, measure mu one. And um, an important uh, also so an important property here is that uh, the Kantorovich for the Kantorovich formulation is actually a relaxation of the Monge problem. Indeed, any transport map induces uh, a transport plan, and that's the identity linking one transport plan to a transport plan. And technically speaking, the Kantorovich formulation is quite uh, um, simpler than Monge 1. So in particular here, we are minimizing a linear functional and we are minimizing that function on a convex set. And it is, it is rather simple to see that uh, that convex set is, all, is always not empty because the product of the two measures is always uh, a possible transport plan. Um, the theory uh, of the optimal transport theory is quite rich. There are uh, several results, very general, regarding a very general class of cost functions. Uh, and typical results are about the existence of the optimal transport plan, of the optimal transport map, uniqueness, stability, duality formulation, uh, regularity, and several others. Of course, I cannot uh, uh, say uh, that much in this talk. I would like just to uh, focus in, a, in a one particular case. Um, I want to consider one particular cost function, which is relevant for what regards the study of uh, Ricci curvature on manifold. And the cost that I want to consider is the cost I'm going to consider is one over alpha the distance squared. And I would like to explain why the optimal transport problem with quadratic cost is related to the geometry and of the space, in particular, is related to the rich curvature of the space. Uh, to do so, I want to start with the theorem, which is this, the this theorem is due to McCann and uh, gener uh, generalizes the result obtained by Brenier in the Euclidean space. And the theorem, the, the theorem says the following. Uh, let us consider a manifold, Mg, compact, say, a Riemannian manifold, compact. And uh, let us study the optimal transport problem with cost, as I said, equal to 1 over 2, the, the distance squared. So here, the distance is the natural Riemannian distance associated to the, the Riemannian metric chain. Um, if we consider uh, two probability measures, that are, say, spread enough, so they are absolutely continuous with respect to the standard volume measure, or if you want, regular enough, then it is possible to show that uh, there exists uh, always a unique transport map, so in particular, uh, even the hard formulation, the Monge formulation admits a solution. And that map can be described in terms of geodesics of the space. Indeed, the map as the following expression is the exponential map at x applied to minus the gradient of a given function phi. Phi is a potential depending on the two, two, two probability measures. And it is the so-called Kantorovich potential. So here, the picture to have in mind is that when we start from mu naught, which is a good probability, me probability measure on a manifold, and we want to go to mu one, uh, do so by following a geodesic. So here, uh, what I'm drawing is a geodesic, and the initial direction is given by the gradient of a potential, which depends on the dual problem. It depends on mu zero on, on, on mu one. And uh, people who are expert in Riemannian geometry can now start understanding why the optimal transport problem is related to uh, the geometry of the space and the Ricci curvature in particular. And to make it uh, even uh, more precise, I want to introduce another concept, the so-called Wasserstein space. 
So again, uh, given a metric structure XD, so here I want to define another metric structure over the space of probability measure. Let us assume again for simplicity that uh, our space X is compact. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna consider a distance, which is the so-called W, uh, the so-called Wasserstein distance, W2, which is defined uh, just by solving the optimal transport problem. So if you want the definition is the following. We take the cost, which is one over two distance squared, and the distance, the square of the distance between zero and new one is given by solving the Kantorovich formulation of the problem. Um, it turns out that uh, W2 is a distance, and it has several good properties. Um, one very important property is the following. If the underlying space X is geodesic, so for instance, a Riemannian manifold is geodesic, but I mean, uh, uh, I can define uh, a, a general metric space to be geodesic if uh, the distance is realized by mean of the infimum of the length of curves connecting to points. So it's a pretty normal loop notion. So if X, uh, XD is uh, geodesic, and complete, say. Then the Wasserstein space is geodesic and complete as well. And uh, Wasserstein geodesics are quite interesting um, with regard to the study of the Ricci curvature. Uh, since it is possible to encode in a very clean way the information of having a lower bound on the rich curvature in terms of uh, uh, convexity type, type property of, of certain energies in the Wasserstein space. And the rigorous statement in, in that direction is the following theorem obtained by um, Sturm and Foreness after, after the contribution of several authors. I should mention the work of Otto and Villani and uh, uh, Cordero, Raskan, McCann, and Smukenslager. And the theorem says the following. Uh, so again, I want to consider a smooth manifold, Riemannian manifold, say compact. Then uh, what happens is that uh, the Ricci curvature of our manifold is non negative if and only if the Shannon entropy, which is the Shannon, the, the Shannon entropy relative to the volume, the, 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 the Riemannian volume measure, which is the map from uh, the space of probability measure to zero plus infinity. Is convex. Is convex uh, with respect to the Wasserstein structure. Um, so here, the, the the Shannon entropy is nothing but uh, rho log rho, uh, the integral of rho log rho, where rho is the is the density of, uh, of a measure. If the measure is not absolutely continuous with respect to the volume, uh, we just declare the entropy to people to infinity. And convexity here means that uh, if you evaluate the entropy along the Wasserstein geodesic, uh, that function should be convex. And what is quite interesting of this characterization is that uh, the first notion having rich curvature bounded below is a second order notion. You need uh, uh, you need the smooth structure and you have to do two derivatives and compute the Ricci curvature. The second notion is really a zero order condition. Uh, in order to define the Wasserstein space, the, 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 the entropy, the, the, the Shannon entropy, you just need uh, a distance and the volume measure. This theorem has to be understood as a Ricci counterpart of, um, of um, uh, Topanogov theorem. The topogonov theorem characterizes spaces with lower bound on the sectional curvature in terms of behaviors of triangles, geodesic triangles. And that's the analog for, for the Ricci curvature. And as it happens for as it happens for spaces with 
lower Ricci curvature bound starting from starting from uh, a characterization like that one can define a class of spaces uh, non-smooth spaces magic measure spaces having Ricci curvature bounded from below basically we take as a definition that characterization we just requires uh, a distance and the volume measure this has been done um, the two fundamental contributions here are uh, the, 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 the Acta paper of Sturm and the Arnold's paper of um, uh, Locke Villani. So they were able to define the notion of uh, metric measure spaces, XDM, satisfying the, so satisfying the so-called CDKN condition, meaning that uh, in a synthetic way, they have rich curvature bounded below by K and dimension bounded above by N. After several works has been introduced the so-called RCDKN condition, R stands for Riemannian, and the aim is to basically uh, rule out a purely Fislerian structure and just keep uh, Riemannian-like structures. And the final class of spaces uh, has received a lot of attention in the last uh, in the last years. Uh, it's quite interesting because it contains uh, a smooth manifold with uh, rich curvature bounded below, weighted manifold, rich limit spaces uh, um, introduced by Chiger and Colding in the in the nineties, Alexandrov spaces, and several other interesting examples. And do I have one minute left? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, I want to conclude this talk by uh, briefly mentioning the two main line of research in that in that field. But the first one is the study of analytic and geometrical structure, analytic and geometrical properties of RCD spaces. As it happens for Alexandro spaces and rich limit spaces, it is interesting to try to understand how far is a general RCD space to be a smooth Riemannian manifold, how singular it can be. There are several positive results in that direction, several open questions, and there are also several interesting results regarding co-dimension one structure in RCD spaces, boundary of RCD spaces, uh, and many other uh, structural type uh, results. And the second line of research regards application of the uh, non-smooth business to the smooth theory, uh, to, the, to the smooth world of uh, Riemannian manifold with lower rich curvature bound. And I think I do not, I do not have time to give explicit examples. Uh, let me just give you the general moral here. Uh, so here the point is that uh, very often while when dealing with spaces, smooth spaces with rich curvature bounded below, one needs to perturb them or just uh, do operations that destroy the smooth structure. So for instance, gluing them uh, uh, along, uh, along a boundary. It's an operation that destroys the smooth structure. The RCD class is stable with respect to any of these reasonable operations and uh, by means of the full power of the non-smooth theory, one can uh, solve several even smooth questions. Uh, I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you. So assume X compact and that geodesic exists for XD. Uh, what happens here is that, so basically, uh, so the space can be also non-compact. And regarding geodesics, uh, basically by definition, they exist. Because when we say that uh, um, the entropy is convex along geodesics, we are assuming that there are busters and geodesics. And busters and geodesics are concentrated along geodesics. And so basically, uh, those spaces are geodesic spaces, basically by definition. Yeah. I just have a basic question. Is this can you put a, a, on the space of probability measures, can you put a, some sort of structure of a manifold and in, in, in such a way that the Weissenstein metric is, uh, comes from a manifold? That's true. At least formally, it can be done. And this is the so-called Otto calculus. Uh, you can put a structure and the vastest and distance is the, the, the Riemannian distance coming from that structure. In several example, examples, you can make it uh, rigorous. And there is also a very interesting line of research 
in which people try to understand a partial differential equation, known partial differential equations like the heat equation, the Kolmogorov equation, the Mirius porous equation, as gradient flows in the vaster time space with respect to that structure. Yeah. And this gives interesting results. Yeah, that, that, that's actually, and, 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 and I missed it. I mean, what is the point of this RCD spaces again? I mean, you define them. Yeah, the point is that uh, once we have that ca characterization of the notion of having Ricci curvature bounded below, you can take that characterization basically as a definition. And that definition works for general metric measure structures. Oh, okay. So that's the point. You don't need at all a total smooth structure. You just have a distance and a measure. That's it. Is more or less what happened for the Alexandrov theory. Thank you. You're welcome. You are telling that there is something looking that there is any structure on this theory. On the vaster same space? Yes. yes, there is. Do we have a notion of curvature? Uh, it is possible. It is possible to define a notion of curvature. Uh, formally speaking, there are so formal computations giving the, the, the uh, curvature tensor in the vaster same space. Uh, at the level of rigorous results, it's not uh, actually very simple to make that computation rigorous. There have been some attempts in the Euclidean space, for instance. Uh, but yes, there is at least a general moral, a general, a general understanding of the vast extent space as an infinite dimensional manifold. So application more to uh, optimal transport or to Riemannian geometry of sort of collapsing matrix positive curvature? Uh, so what applications there? Ah, uh, here. So I mean, just to give, let me try to give one example yeah. of application of, of recent application. Um, trying to so one interesting problem in uh, Riemannian geometry is to um, find uh, isoperimetric regions in non-smooth spaces. If we consider a space with non-negative Ricci curvature, which is a quite natural place to study the isoperimetric problem. Uh, what, happens, what happens is that the space at infinity really looks like uh, a singular cone. And in order to study existence of isoperimetric region, one needs to look at the space at infinity. And having attempt uh, um, a good calculus, uh, uh, a good second order calculus and several other properties for non-smooth spaces, uh, in the end, one can manage to prove existence of, of isoperimetric region under some reasonable assumption of, of the space at infinity. So we have a new definition of curvature inequality if P is not C2. Uh, so you mean uh, the theorem? So there, I mean, you can also define like we, 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 we weak solution of this. Right? So do they agree or? Um, ah, you mean weak solution of non, uh, uh, there is uh, there is a work, I don't remember the author, in which they introduce a lower bound on the Ricci curvature in a viscous sensor, which is a weak sensor, and they actually prove that it agrees with uh, the, 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 RCD, the, the RCD notion. And my guess would be that uh, almost any reasonable uh, notion of weak solution in terms of the metric, uh, of weak solution of uh, Ricci curvature non negative in terms of, of the metric, would agree with the RCD, the RCD notion. And the reason, if you want, is that. Uh, the RCD, the RCD notion is very, very stable. If you perturb a bit in any reasonable topology, like the of Hausdorff topology, the space is still RCD. So it's very hard to go out to the RCD class by means of, um, by means of operations that are reasonable, of course. Okay, I guess if there are no more questions, thanks.